What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the huddle. We are live today on Friday to close out the week. The usual suspects here with Rich, Richie Melora. We got Dan Mitchell and your boy Tony Dow. Thank you all for tuning in again. Make sure you subscribe to the huddle. We are live Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. It is about to go down today. We got a lot of good stuff to talk about before we even dive into the topics let's go ahead and check with my partners here what's going on richie how you feeling today man feeling great friday <laughs> we got a nice weekend upon us coming off a big win from my knicks last night the jets continue to dominate the offseason i'm not gonna even bring up my mets because they make me sick <laughs> to my stomach but we are here live on the huddle always a pleasure best time of the day folks we're very close to 6,000 subscribers yeah. on BetUS TV. And that's because of all of you folks. So maybe we can hit 6K by the end of the show. So guys, hit the subscribe button for your boys right here at the huddle. We appreciate each and every one of you guys tuning in daily, baby. Let's go. Let's go. What's up, Dan, man? How you feeling? Dude, I'll tell you what, man. It's my first day on the carnivore diet. Okay. Oh. And so I'm not sure if you guys are. And so you know what that means, right? It's, it's just meat, dude. Like I just got done with a nice little... T boner right here. Oh, just got it off of the bone. Pause. A couple slices of butter, some milk. Pause. I'm gonna try it. Yeah, dude. No one eats more meat than your boy right over here. I'm gonna tell you what. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what, my friends. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm gonna try it for 30 days. See what's going on. But outside, what's the of benefits that, with the carnivore diet? Uh, you know what? I just listened to like a Joe Rogan podcast, like 20 minutes. He tried it for 30 days. I think it's just like pure protein, like energy, et cetera, like lose fat, like really well. Um, it's, I don't know. I'm just trying it out. I mean, I'll definitely tell you how my bathroom breaks are, but outside of that, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, I did give the responsibility of TD planning this show today. And I said, TD, you should host. So folks, let's fasten our seatbelts. I'm sure he's going to knock it out of the park. But I wanted to come into an episode blind for once, like not know what's going on. What's he going to throw in my face? I'm sure there's going to be a 30-minute segment of why Josh Allen's trash, and I'm sure the other 30 minutes is going to be like why Brees Hall is an absolute bum. But I'm excited to see what he has in store for us. That's for sure. Well, we all know Brees Hall is not a bum. He's one of the best running backs in the entire NFL. But Josh Allen might get traded this offseason. But we're not going to put. We're not going to talk about that today. We're not going to talk about that today. We have a lot of topics to talk about today. I'm doing great myself, man. I'm excited. This is the funnest part of my days, Monday through Friday. Again, ladies and gentlemen, punch that like button. Let's go ahead and get that part of the thing going right now. Hit that like button if you're tuning in right now. Shout out to those watching on Twitter and shout out to all those watching on YouTube right now. This is Bet US TV. Now let's dive in because one thing I thought about, I started to you know soak in my brain there are a lot of coaches and quarterbacks that actually should be on the hot seat this year and i thought why not talk about that today because all of these quarterbacks they've made black friday the cuts and all black monday whatever you want to call it all the firing i believe is done at the coaching position a lot of the quarterbacks wherever they wanted to go have pretty much somewhat been situated other than the draft and maybe a few after but i want to get into a few potential hot seat candidates this year, okay? I have some top candidates, and I want to bring these candidates up one by one, and I want you all to tell me what your thoughts are of these candidates right now, and pull out your crystal ball and tell me where do you see them after this season. Here we go, baby. Let's go. We're going to start at the top of the board. The best quarterback on this board who's on, who's potentially on the hot seat, Dak Prescott. Let's start with you, Dan. Talk to us, man. How do you feel about him? Do you believe he's on the hot seat? And what do you see after this season um, with Dak Prescott? Dude, one, dude, 110%. He's already a New England Patriot in 2025. I can tell you <laughs> You can't tell me that Jerry Jones, and I mean, listen, he has definitely had a share of actions that could be criticized, 
But you can't tell me that you're allowing this man to still be on your roster while eating so much of the cap mm. while he's on there. They didn't restructure him. This is not a prove-it deal. I personally think that the Dallas Cowboys are just completely over this guy. I'm not going to say, hey, listen, I think that he's trying to tank the entire season, maybe get Shador, maybe bring in Deion Sanders to be the head coach. But it's interesting, man, because now you have a quarterback and you have a head coach. This almost feels, based off of free agency, that this is going to be somewhat of a throwaway season. I still see the Cowboys performing as they typically do. I still see them winning double-digit games this year, largely because they are in the NFC. But, I mean, dude, listen, if they wanted to keep Dak Prescott, they would have restructured him. They would have given him a new deal this year, something to push money down the road. Um, This is the beginning of a rebuild for the Dallas Cowboys. It's just being paused until next offseason. So, yes, 1,010%. He is not yeah. only on the hot seat, he will be on a different team next year. My pick is the is the New England Patriots. So you don't think the New England Patriots are going to get their young, shiny quarterback this year? Listen, I'll be honest with you. Do not be surprised if the Patriots trade down this year with somebody. Do not be surprised no. whatsoever. I could see them maybe rolling the dice and waiting until the second and then maybe trying to get like uh, Spencer Rattler or maybe try and roll the dice on getting a Michael Penix later on in the road or like later down in the first depending on who their trade partner is. But I think what they want right now is that they want to go on ahead and they want to get Dak next offseason. And so I think it makes sense. Wow, interesting. Richie, what are your thoughts on Dak Prescott? Where do you see him in 2025? And is he even on the hot seat? Yeah, I mean, he's on the hot seat just because he's into your contract year. So he's kind of like, okay, the Cowboys are not restructuring his deal And he has to go out there and not only have a good regular season, but get the Cowboys far in the playoffs because he's coming off an all pro season. He was the second team all pro, which is, you know, a very good accolade for a quarterback. So it's not like he's a bum or anything. He's coming off a phenomenal season for the Cowboys. But his issue is similar to Tua. Can't step up when the matter is most in the playoffs. Can you do that? I don't know if I agree with Dan about the Patriots. I think they're about to draft their top quarterback, and I think they're going to build around him and roll with Jacoby Brissett as the guy to start this year and let the rookie uh, learn behind him. Um, I don't really see Dak going to New England personally, even though there was some speculation about that. So I definitely know that there is some noise surrounding that. Uh, But I don't know. I think that Dak is going to ride it out with the Cowboys. And my personal take is that the Cowboys might roll it back with Dak. I think that um, this is a move that they're probably going to figure out a way to keep him around town next year. So I personally predict that Dak Prescott will not be going anywhere. He's going to have a similar season than last year, one of the better quarterbacks in the league statistically, and then actually get over the hump in the playoffs this year, potentially, and have him come back to Dallas. Wow. Um, I'm going to throw a wrench in here, okay? So first and foremost, um, the, the, the Dallas Cowboys are crazy. They're going to literally, at least right now, they're giving us the impression that they're going to eat $55.5 million of a cap hit this season for Dak Prescott, okay? Then he is actually a free agent, but on the flip side of that, they have voidable years on his contract, a total of four of them. Next year, he's going to be a $40.5 million cap hit, and he's not even going to be on the team, potentially. The year after that, he's a $12 million um, cap hit, and and then the last two years is one million, one million. So that tells me that his future in Dallas is not bright because even if they were to restructure and stretch his deal out, they've already structured it to where they have dead cap in the. I mean, they have a cap hit in the future with dead cap, and it's gonna hurt them long term. That's why they've been in the situation that they've been in all this time and needed to move on from offensive linemen and all of those big contracts in the trenches. Now, I'm going to throw a wrench in here, and I'm going to go with Dan on this. New England Patriots. But I'm going to throw a a bigger curveball with the Patriots. Let's hear it. Draft the New England Patriots trade for Dak Prescott. They're one of the teams with the most cap space. He may be in that, and that might be the third overall pick. And guess what? Jerry Jones may even trade the third overall pick even after that and not get one of these young guys because I am starting to believe in the Deion Sanders and Shakir Sanders hype more than anything now. Can you imagine? Dak Prescott going to the Patriots right now in the in the uh, 
um, Dallas Cowboys getting number three. Then they pay, trade that for a boatload of picks with like a team like Minnesota, and they're all geared up to make sure that they could get Dion and Shadur the very next year. That's what you call a master plan. And I'm telling you now, I just still can't see them eating $55 million of a cap hit this year. He might get traded this offseason. What you think of that, Dan? Like, I'm obviously mind blown right now. So what you're saying right now <laughs> is, is it makes sense. It makes so you're essentially saying that he's up on the trade block draft night, Dak Prescott or now or now. There, I feel like there could be discussions now. How can the Dallas Cowboys really eat a fifty five million dollar cap hit this year? They can, but. Like, this is why they haven't made any moves because they don't have any money to do so. And if you're not going to extend him, then you're basically content with the team that you have now going into the draft. Do you even have much money to pay those draft picks? So um, I could see Dak potentially getting moved right away. And, and then them going with the bridge quarterback, securing a high draft pick and picking up another high draft pick from making the trade. And if they want to swap with the guy like, I mean, a team like Minnesota, I mean, Dallas can look up and they have five first round picks next year. And with Dion already saying, they're not going to go to a team that he doesn't want to go to, then Dallas will have all the leverage to trade those picks for the number one or number two, whatever it may be, overall pick, and get where they need to be. And so do you think that Jerry Jones would be able to go through a throwaway season? Because if Dak's uh, that, Well, I mean, that again, because we saw how successful they were uh, when they had that backup in when Dak was hurt. Mm. Who was it? It was Cooper or something. Cooper Rush. Yeah, Rush. They yeah, went Rush on a win streak. Damn yep. games by like, but. I think Jerry's just fine with it. If you couldn't win last this is year, blasphemous. You, okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, so sick of sitting here in silence. Like I'm Richie. waiting for someone so, to talk, ask so, me how I feel about this. So Richie, nonsense. like you're telling me it doesn't have legs. Like no. I just Why? learned that he has so many voidable years on his contract, so they could very easily, very easily move some money down. But they're just staying put, 55 million cap number, and this is mo and this is not dead money either. This is not money that's already not in his bank money. account. This is money that needs to be. Paid to him this year in his pocket. It it doesn't make financial sense. And you're telling me there's no legs that he's not at least on the block. I, I got to ask Richie this. All for him. I have to ask Richie this. How confident do you think the Dallas Cowboys are this year in the NFC, knowing that other teams got better and you massively just just busted out in the playoffs like you always do? How and you lost pieces? How confident do you think Jerry Jones feels about this roster right now? So you think his solution is to blow it all up and go from <laughs> all in? He's yeah. got to take advantage of what he's got right now. He's got Micah Parsons, C.D. Lamb, and Dak Prescott under contract this year. They're not going to be able to afford all of them anything. at the same time. He doesn't have anything. All he has are those Who doesn't guys. Have anything? D Jerry Jones, he doesn't have anything young and shiny like that. He could take his his digs. He could take his Michael Parsons. He could take his wide receiver and restructure their contract for the future and go ahead and bring your young quarterback. He's tried every puzzle piece with Dak Prescott. We're acting like Dak Prescott isn't around, what, maybe 10 years now or something like that? At the end of the day, he sees the whole Romo situation reoccurring right in front of his eyes. What they gave, and, and, and here's the caveat out to it, Richie. Did Dak Prescott not just come off of his best professional year, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL this season? See, yeah. see, see and, and Jerry Jones said, I'm not going to pay you an extension right now. What's the hold up? What's the red? What more do you want to see? He played almost on an MVP level. What more do you need to see? That's writing on the wall to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm just not buying in. First of all, I don't think there's a team out there that want to trade for that type of money unless you can restructure the contract when you bring in Dak Prescott. Mm -hmm. I don't see the the Dallas Cowboys making a move like that. Like They are a team that was built is built to win right now. And if you do that, you are completely kicking the can and you are retooling this team and you're wasting the prime years of Micah Parsons and CeeDee Lamb. The way that you... like. I, I'm sorry to tell you guys this, but I feel like everyone just thinks it's so easy to find a rookie quarterback to win Super Bowls with. 
it's not easy to do that. Let's, let's, let's stop true. pretending here like the philosophy that the Houston Texans are doing. Oh, why don't we all do it? Okay, Dallas, let's just trade Dak and then bring in a rookie quarterback. What if he sucks? Then what? You waste Micah Parsons, you waste CeeDee Lamb, and now you have a new bust on your hands. Dak Prescott is a good quarterback, an upper echelon quarterback. You wait, you try to win with him. You double down with Dak. You hope that he can improve. He's one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. You're taking way more risk of going after a rookie than you are bringing in a quarterback or sticking with a quarterback like Dak Prescott that's proven to put up top, top tier level numbers. That would be a, a terrible move if you're Dallas, just absolutely wasting the prime years of their elite talent of Micah Parsons and CeeDee Lamb, in my opinion, because stop pretend. let's just stop pretending that just drafting a quarterback is 100% guarantee that you can go out there and win on a, a rookie contract. It's not that easy. It's totally not easy. Not a lot of teams are able to figure it out. The Texans are like the only team right now that's able to figure that out. And then all the other squads around there, right? Tua's going to have to get paid. Josh Allen got paid. You know, even in our division, you see it. Uh, Patrick Mahomes got paid. Joe Burrow. So those quarterbacks kind of got their contracts. But I don't really think that the Dallas Cowboys drafting a quarterback this year and then going all in. I mean, that could not end up being. Year. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're, you're like projecting in just a, a, a punt of a season this year. Like, I just cannot mm -hmm. buy in Jerry Jones doing that. That's just you not. Know, you know why? Because every season has been a punt of the season anyway. You get to the playoffs and fold every year. It's been a pun anyway. Uh, Maybe that's their philosophy. Maybe he loves selling tickets, right? Dallas Cow the Dallas Cowboys likes to, you know, they're the one of the biggest faces of the league in terms of an organization. Mm -hmm. And maybe, and this has been a problem with the, my New York teams, not even just the Jets, but just overall, my least favorite thing about the owners is it felt like they were content with just putting a product on the field Money. that would sell tickets. Well, if, if if maybe that's the case, Richie, then d doesn't this have even more legs than Shadur Sanders and Deion Sanders coming to Dallas? But, but you can't bank that on covering? that. If you're yeah, making you a can. move, you can, if you're making you a move them. right now to try to go after a prospect that's entering the draft next year, uh -huh. that's terrible no. organization play, no. bro. No, what are you yeah, doing? It, it is terrible, but this Why is Why are you pretending do. like, okay, wait, let, let me just re redo this Thanks whole thing. So. You're that, telling that me that you're early. you're telling me you want the or the Dallas should trade Dak so they can tank this year to get the number one pick. The Dolphins tank for Tua. This is what organizations are doing. No, yeah. they don't, bro. It's, that is the worst thing you can uh, possibly <laughs> say. No I, NFL team does that. You can't tell so the fan base the that Dolphins we're you're gonna go up to Tua? Michael Parsons and CeeDee Lamb and say we're punting this year to try to get <laughs> Sanders. They say get me the hell out of here. Like that's the worst thing. What? So are you saying the Dolphins didn't tank for Tua? You're saying that teams don't tank for a better draft pick the next year? I'm talking about the Dallas Cowboys. Don't bring in other organizations. The current structure of the Cowboys, the, the season they had last year, how can you possibly sell the fan base? Yeah, uh, we're going to sell, we're going to trade away Dak and tank for Sanders. Houston That's like tank. the worst possible approach you can do for an organization based off where the Dallas Cowboys, in my opinion. Well, what's been hurting the Dallas Cowboys is the fact that they've been drafting in the 20s or later every year, and it doesn't amount to anything. It's a constant state of purgatory, and it's the same thing that they did with Tony Romo for almost 20 years, it felt like, and now they see they're headed down that same road with Dak Prescott. I'm just saying, this is something I'm throwing out there. doesn't make it right. And oh, I, I know. You, I you and Dan are very aligned with those type of hypotheticals. Listen, hey, hey uh, a, a few <laughs> days ago, we would have said Stefan Diggs would have never got traded. You never That's know what I'm talking about, man. He was traded for peanuts and a Subway <laughs> gift card, bro. Subway gift card. Well, I'm going to you got a, you got a nice saying. second rounder next year. Yeah, second round. But still, I mean, I think <laughs> that all three of us were like at the belief, and I mean, outside of y'all just like making jokes and stuff like that, that no one thought that it was fiscally responsible to trade Stephon Diggs. No one thought that Saquon Barkley was going to absolutely uh, smack New York in the face and go sign with <laughs> the best mm -hmm. rival of all time. No one thought that Jordan Poyer would sign with the Miami Dolphins after the Buffalo Bills, man. Listen, yeah, so hurt. many of the no way that happens happened this year in free agency. This has been the mm -hmm. wildest offseason ever. No one knows anything, and I love it. And it's set yeah, to get but wilder. But 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 my problem is we're we're bringing up these crazy like Justin Herbert and now Dak Prescott like you guys got to stop. I'm Just, shocked you don't think that could get traded if they're not even going to commit. This year, here, here's the here's the problem though, Richie. It's 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 financially more 
productive to extend him now. I don't get you Why know next year. <laughs> Like, like it makes no sense. They are basically telling him you're not in our future. And so I, that's all I'm saying. That's it. Now, remember, Dak does have a no trade clause, but if they set up a trade with somebody, if they're not going to extend him, he would take the trade because whatever team bringing him in means that they're going to be willing to go ahead and extend him and give him his money right away, the big money. So that's incentive for him to say, yeah, trade. And here's another kicker. Just because they're not giving him his money, he might actually be the one that says, I want to get traded. Right now, he could actually be the one saying, trade me. Because he has no guarantees after this. If he gets hurt this year, his market tanks next year. So that's a huge possible as well that Dak could even be the one that's pushing for a trade right now if they don't want to extend him. It's a lot going on in Dallas. I think there's more than this potential um, than you think. But time always tells me. I know it sounds crazy, Richie, but we've seen some crazy stuff lately, Richie. I mean, you're saying the Bills are going to trade Stop, Josh but, Allen. I know you're joking with that. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. That's a joke. They need to, but yeah. That's yeah, but, like, but I mean – so no one really thought that that – so the Russell Wilson trade would have happened. I mean, like, I knew that they wanted to move away from him, but damn that dude. <laughs> dude, they, they ate a lot of dead cap. No one thought that was fiscally responsible either. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, man. Teams are eating dead cap right now for, for because they're exercising a lot more voidable years that they didn't used to exercise. I think everybody's become voidable year monsters because they see the business is growing so much. So general managers are leveraging that, expecting big returns on the cap number every year. Um, So I think that's why a lot of GMs are diving into the voidable years more now. But time will tell because I want to move on to the next quarterback and I want to start with Richie and get your thoughts. Same question, same thought process. Where do you see Tua Tagovailoa after this season? And is he even on the hot seat? I think he's going to be a Miami Dolphin for the next five years. I think that uh, the Miami Dolphins are going to figure out a way to get a contract done with him by the start of the season. I don't think it's going to happen all the way until training camp. I think it's going to be one of those. We saw it with Joe Burrow. I believe it was last year he got his extension right before week one. I think it's going to be one of those situations. Um, I don't really think two is on the hot seat because he's going to get his contract. I think it's just a matter of can he step up and perform in the postseason. We know what he can do in the regular season. He could put up elite level numbers against subpar opponents, but can he do those things against good opponents? And I'm trying not to sound like a hater. I'm speaking objectively. What we've learned from Tua Tagovailoa up until this point is that he's a quarterback that has elite timing. Okay, his anticipation and putting the ball where it needs to be for his wide receivers to be at that spot is better than a lot of different people. His anticipation, throwing the football, his ability to stay within the structure of the offense. But when the play breaks down, is he able to extend plays? Is he able to put the team on his back, if you will, going up against elite level defenses? Can he put the team up and go down the field? in the fourth quarter, down four points with three minutes to go to go score a touchdown to win the football game. And we have not seen that from him. But around that, we've seen a lot of numbers, a lot of production. And I think the Miami Dolphins have done a tremendous job building around him with playmakers and um, overall just offensive scheme with Mike McDaniel. So the Dolphins are in a very interesting spot. I don't see him going anywhere. I think they're going to give him a contract similar to Daniel Jones where it's a lot of upfront money in the first couple seasons and they can get out of it after two years. Uh, but on the surface level, it'll be like a four-year mega deal. Um, so I don't really think Tua is going anywhere. I really personally don't. I think that the Dolphins will be keeping him long-term because they feel like they can win with him. They proved that they can win with him, but what they haven't proved yet is that they can't win at all. And that's the same thing with Dak Prescott. Like, like the Miami Dolphins are in a win-now mode. And I know some Dolphins fans are not satisfied with Tua. You don't want, or some people love Tua and think that he is the guy. Obviously, I know there's two sides here with the Miami Dolphins fan base. But, like, don't you want to double down on a quarterback that lead, led the league in passing yards and maybe he can improve and he has another year on the system and maybe he can get over the hump rather than going back to square zero all over again? Same exact conversation with the Dallas Cowboys, with the Miami Dolphins, because I think Tua and Dak are very similar in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, that's what I would have to say. I think the Dolphins and Tua get a – um, extension done b- right before the season begins. Real quick, um, Richie, follow up on that. Say the Dolphins don't give him an extension and they make him play his fifth year option because negotiations break down. Um, do you still feel the same way? Him playing a fifth season 
just um, your projection is that he's going to be just fine this year and he's going to be re-signed eventually because he's going to ball out? Um, well, if he has, like, another season, then, like, like say he's just, like, a spitting image of last year. Mm-hmm. The Dolphins have 10-11 wins. He is at the upper echelon of passing yards, but he crumbles in the playoffs. He's a free agent. That's going to be the big question. I think that um, they have the franchise tag ready to go, so say they want to do it all over again. All right, we'll get to another year. So they have the leverage, the Dolphins, as an organization. That's the same exact thing with Lamar Jackson. I think that's going to happen with Miami. Uh, remember, it took the Ravens like a long time to get a deal with, done with him, and it was a big deal. Oh, extension, extension. Nope, we're franchise tagging. You're playing on the franchise tag. So I think that that's another situation that the Dolphins are going to be in. Say he goes out there and plays good ball, but not good enough to really give him that long-term extension. The Dolphins have the leverage. They're like, okay, you were able to do it again, but we still want you to get better. Prove it again. Here's the franchise tag. And then, of course, Tua and his camp will probably be upset with that, and there might be some issues. But uh, we, we saw it happen with Lamar, and it worked out for both parties with the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson in the end. Dan, your thoughts, Tua? So I'll tell you what, man. There's two things. There's something I think the Dolphins should do, and there's something I think the Dolphins will do. What I think they should do is I think that they should ride out the fifth-year option, and then I should sort of see this as a prove-it see whether or not that he deserves that money. If not, then they have a clean break, and then they can go on ahead and they can revisit the draft next year or maybe even attempt to draft an insurance policy uh, this year in the second round, for example. Maybe even be ballsy, shock the world, take Penix in the first. That could even be a possibility. That is what I think they should do. However, what I do think is I will probably piggyback off of Richie. I do believe that they will find some sort of extension because what is it like 24, 25 million against the cap for the fifth year option right now going right into his pocket. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult, especially say for example, that, you know, so the Dolphins start off hot this year and then now this trade deadline is up and they want to be able to make a move that could help them, you know, sort of, push forward like they did last year or the year before. I think that they will. It's, it's probably going to be, i say, closer to training camp, maybe after the draft by itself. But say that I was the GM, man, I, dude, I mean, I don't think that he's proven enough to where I think that he deserves a contract like that. And the whole comparison of a Daniel Jones sort of contract, you don't want to give him that sort of contract. You want him to earn that kind of contract. So having him play throughout that fifth-year option – wouldn't be something that hasn't been done before. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Lamar Jackson did that, right? He played on his fifth-year option without even seeing any sort of deal. And I think that Lamar definitely proved a hell of a lot more during his career than Tua has so far. So that's what I think. But I don't know. For some reason, I have a feeling that they're going to go on ahead and they're just going to um, just be super anxious and get it done sooner than it should. So it seems like the sentiment um, in almost every community is that the Dolphins should have him pay his fifth year option. And until, you know, keep moving it down the road, fifth year franchise tag on deck if necessary following years. But they've, they've shown sentiments that they are working on a deal and trying to get it done this offseason. Basically, they're going in blind, in my opinion. And it's just a matter of if it works out, good blind guess. If it doesn't work out, then man, oh, man, we are stuck for the next next four years, not five, but four, because the guarantees will probably run out fifth year, three years worth of guarantees. It'll be four years in Miami um, and not, and he won't play the last two of his contract. I mean, and I will say about, about the Daniel Jones contract, the reason I like why I Daniel said Jones that contract, actually. yeah, if you're the Dolphins, you want that Daniel Jones contract. I would contract. take that. Front because loaded. you get yeah, front, front loaded, loaded and you get out of it. I mean, yeah, that, 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 that way, less like, risk. Still, yeah, because that way, like you still have Tyreek, and so you still have some of your other players that are on like these contracts, like your star players, and for the most part. And say, for example, that Tua does not pan out in the two to three years when the cap hit significantly drops after the second year, then you'll be completely fine. Well, the Dolphins can't front load a Tua contract. Any Tua contract, they can't front load. You know, you saw we just came out of negative 51 to start this year. You know, and then when we looked at the projections for next year, we would have 65 million in today. That's down to 20. So yeah. they can't front load any in a quarterback's contract, um, anything over 25, 30 million starting next year. They definitely can't front load. So, um, 
this is just a case where I just feel like the organization could either be smart or not be responsible and just go guessing because a lot of people said it was irresponsible to draft the quarterback with the injury concerns he had anyway at five to begin with. Um, so here we are. We have a history of being irresponsible. Um, but so I see him in my crystal ball being a Miami Dolphin with the jersey on starting for games next season um, in 2025 with the big contract. Um, I just hope that 2024 didn't end in disappointment with that happening. Time will tell. Let's move to another quarterback. Um, this guy pretty much has a guaranteed contract because he was um, the top quarterback pick. But Bryce Young, Bryce Young, what do we have here, Dan? What's your thoughts on him in 2025 after this season? Typically, okay. Tip. I am on the belief that I believe that any sort of rookie quarterback does deserve to have three years. Now, there's a lot of context put into the Carolina Panthers situation uh, because not only he is on his third head coach right now in Carolina. OK, and that included Reich and then the interim and then now his brand new head coach going into it. Um, in my opinion, if he even shows a semblance of improvement, really in any sort of statistical category, I think you almost need to give him a third year. I really, really do. Now, I mean, say, for example, that everything goes wrong and when David Tepper absolutely loses his mind once again and he fires Callahan or whoever their new coach is, I forget uh, right off the top of my head. But their brand new head coach, say, for example, that he absolutely lays an egg and then Tepper is way too fast. He fires him almost immediately. Then I think you have to give him a third year going into it. So, um, it sucks. It definitely does. It's not like that he was blessed with an absolute incredible, incredible environment. CJ Stroud was a different story, but he's an anomaly when it comes down into performances from rookie quarterbacks. Bryce Young, I wouldn't say that he's on a hot seat. I'll probably stick to my guns and say that you give him at least three years, especially considering all the circumstances. Well, let me let me follow up on that with you and ask you. So if he plays like Zach Wilson did this year, that mm. would be an upgrade, right? Hey, I mean, really? No, uh, no, no, not, not to be funny, but it, sure. if he plays like Zach Wilson did this year, that would still be an upgrade for Bryce Bryce Young, right? Uh, yeah. And you would still give him a third year? I would. Because I would. I mean, they, if he plays they, like Zach Wilson, he'd upgrade. Because Bryce Young, I mean, who do you think the worst quarterback was in, was in the NFL last year? Zach Wilson. You think so, Richie? Yeah. <laughs> we had the oh, worst quarterback know. play in the league. Tim Boyle, I mean. It, well, he didn't, but Zach didn't play the whole season, right? So yeah. He got benched because he no. sucked. Uh, well, I mean, did you watch Bryce Young last year? Yeah, I mean, he, he was definitely... pretty bad, too. I'm curious. I don't really know his numbers. Yeah, no, 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 no. He was pretty bad, too. He was... I mean, he had a positive touchdown-interception ratio. Zach that does have close with that, even though it's 11-10. Okay, 10. okay. Well, maybe wrong example, okay? Wrong example. Well, what I'm saying is, what if he gets better, but it's still pretty bad? It is improvement, but it's bad. And the only reason I'm asking you that, Dan, is because... Yeah. Have you seen they've been actually loading the roster? Are they going to waste the roster that they're yeah, paying for now? I, see, I think their mentality is to be like, okay, let's actually put a little bit of talent around him and see what he can do. Mm -hmm. But I just think, man, that head coaching carousel buys him a third. Okay. What about you, Richie? Of course he's getting a third year. Of course <laughs> he is. I mean, that would be a mistake. Unless he just completely blows up in your, in your faces yeah, and shows no yeah, sign. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But, like, we're talking about the first overall pick. You want me to sh – curious, actually, right now. Hold on one second as I pull up these stats. Oh, perfect. Stat guy, Richie. You know who had a worse rookie season than Bryce Young? Who is that? Josh Allen. Touche. He, he had a worse season. I'm looking at right – Okay. Josh Allen, 52 completion percentage, 10 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 67.9 rating. Yeah. Bryce Young, 59 completion percentage, way better. 2,800 yards, 800 yards better. 11 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, 73 rating. 
Yeah. So why are we just pretending here that he's a bust after one season? What did Josh Allen do in year number two? Showed a slight improvement. 20 touchdowns and nine interceptions. But then that year three was where he broke out into the elite player that he is. So the Carolina Panthers are loading up. Of course you give him three years. Every quarterback you draft deserves three years, in my opinion. Every draft pick. Not just quarter, throw the quarterback out. You got to give these. I hate when teams so prematurely, even fan bases say this player is a bust. You got to give him three years to really establish himself in this league. And I, I know that Bryce Young had a bad rookie season, but you see all the different examples I just thrown at you. The Panthers would be smart to keep loading around him, get him a year. Now he has a brand new system, right? This is kind of be another rookie season for him because it's not like he has year two of the same coaching staff. They got a new coaching staff in the building. And then in year number three is when you expect that leap. It takes time to develop quarterbacks. Let's stop looking at C.J. Stroud and all these quarterbacks and just expect every young quarterback to be studs right away. Some quarterbacks and some players take time to develop, and that's okay. And if, t- if the Carolina Panthers are smart, they'll be patient with him. They'll keep building around him. And, you know, they invested a first overall pick. If they're just so quick to kick him down to the curb because they don't believe in him, then they have that reason. But I'm here to tell you guys, I think that will be a mistake. I'm not, not really just saying that I think Bryce Young has all this talent and stuff. I'm just saying it from the perspective of it will be way too premature to do that. And obviously, it really comes down to what he does in year number two before you can say, does he deserve it in year number three? Like if he replicates his last season and shows no signs of improvements, that's a different conversation. He needs to show up and have a little jump in year two, and then year three is the year you'd expect a guy like Bryce Young to really prove why he was the first overall pick. That's what the Panthers' perspective should be with him as a quarterback. They should not expect him to go nuclear this year. Not to say it's not impossible, by the way. All of a sudden, he could take over the league all of a sudden. We're like, what? This came out of nowhere. How many times have we seen that in the NFL? But that's really my thoughts and my philosophy of it. Josh Allen had a worse rookie year than Bryce Young, and everyone's saying Bryce Young is a bust, and he sucks. Just to put things in perspective. So do you think the Arizona Cardinals moved off of Josh Rosen too soon? Yes, I do, and I will die on that hill. I do. I sincerely do. And his other three team opportunities, you know, <laughs> they moved on too soon as well? Well, what that does to a young quarterback is different- first off, well, like, like, let's reflect, like, on the teams that he was sent over to. Who was he traded to directly after the Cardinals? Does anyone remember? The Dolphins. Okay, was it the Dolphins going into it? And you also, point, I think that was the Tannehill years. So you essentially had a kid. It was, it was Ryan Fitzpatrick. Tannehill was gone. Okay, well, I mean, I would definitely choose Ryan Fitzpatrick of that, especially over somebody that just came from a pretty toxic environment uh, that obviously had issues with the head coaching situation, obviously had a lot of things like that. Just the team wasn't good. Um, no, dude, listen, man. I think that Josh Rosen, if they were to give him three years over in Arizona – I'm not saying he'd be the starter over in Arizona, but I still think he'd be a starting caliber quarterback in this league. So here's my also thing. Have to add things. You also have to put things in perspective, TD. Cardinals had the first overall pick, which gave him the opportunity to draft Kyler Murray. So they were weighing their options. We have a chance to get Kyler Murray or keep Josh Rosen. They drafted Rosen 10th overall the year prior. Kyler Murray's the first overall pick. So that's a different situation. If the Panthers all of a sudden have the first overall pick next year, then we'll have a conversation about that. So here's my thing. I don't think um, teams move on from quarterbacks too early at all. I think you, when you know, you know. Um, I know that we use Josh Allen as an example, but Josh Allen statistically actually wasn't worse than Bryce Young um, his rookie season. Josh Allen, if I'm not mistaken, only played 11, 11 games, I believe, his rookie year. Uh, Bryce Young played all 16. Josh Allen also, this is what I always say when you struggle as a quarterback throwing the ball early on. Do you have that superpower that can carry you until you get better? And Josh Allen did, even as a rookie, only 11 games, I believe, 11 or 12. He ran for over 600 rushing yards. If he would have played a full season, he would have had 1,000 yards rushing. He would have had 3,000 yards passing. So that's why Josh Allen, at least he had the intangibles to survive as a quarterback in the interim. Same reason they kept going with Daniel Jones, because he had that cannon and could be a little mobile, you know. But when you look at a guy like Bryce Young, what else does he have, you know? 
What else do, do you? That's why so many fans are disgusted. They don't even see hope out of him. They don't see anything materializing. They don't see the non-mobile quarterbacks, him turning into Peyton Manning. They don't see him turning into Drew Brees. They don't see that in a guy like Bryce Young. I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's over for him. I think Bryce Young doesn't even make it through the full season. I think when Carolina, after about eight games, and they're two and six, they're going to potentially reach to the backup or before the trade deadline, try to bring somebody in to not waste the talent on their roster. I honestly think that they're going to sit him and they, he may be a Panther in year three, but he may be behind a much better quarterback and let his contract play out because I don't think it's going to go south to sour like it did. Um, sorry, like it did in um in in New York with Zach Wilson. I don't think it's going to go south and sour because he's not the type to vocally say little things here and there, you know. Um, but I don't see him. Um, being a starter next year for the – not next year, but in 2025 for the Carolina Panthers. Just my thoughts on that, right? All right, one more. One more, guys. Uh, Daniel Jones, they gave him the contract extension um, last last year. Um, it's not really working out pretty much. They've been on the – on you know, rumors that they're growing tired and they're thinking of moving on. He's still on the roster. What do you see from Daniel Jones, maybe even this year or next year? Cause they're rumored to be maybe looking at a quarterback. We can start with Richie on this one. Yeah. He is not a giant long-term, at least if the giants are smart, I don't see Daniel Jones as a good quarterback. He has had all the time to, to prove it. Giants fans will be like, yeah, but his offensive line, yeah, but his offensive line, yeah, but, 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 but. I get it. I know what it's like to have a young quarterback, and you want to make all the excuses in the world. I've been through that, been through that. But the great quarterbacks are able to deal with a lot. I mean, like, I, I always go, fall back on C.J. Stroud. Like, who was going into the season with the Texans? Like, oh, look at the, the, the job that the Texans did surrounding C.J. Stroud with all these weapons in his rookie year. No, they said that after the fact because C.J. Stroud is the one that was elevating that entire team. Daniel Jones has an issue with fumbling that will never, ever go away. Like, that is a problem. Mm. Like, you can, you can figure out a way to turn back the interceptions. At least, I don't know, because look at Josh Allen. He seems to be going the wrong direction with that. But – uh, uh. I think Daniel Jones is not going to be a long-term giant. I think there's a possibility they even draft a quarterback this year. I think Brian Dable wants his own guy. I, I mean, at least if they're smart, because you look at what the Giants have. I mean, they they, they loaded up on their defense this year, adding Brian Burns. Uh, they got they got a lot of talent on that defense. Kayvon Thibodeau broke out last year. Um, they got Dexter Lawrence. They have an okay, decent secondary. But when it comes to the offense, bro, they got nothing. Oh, uh oh, some in the chat's going to say they got, he's got Darren Waller. Darren Waller, bro, he's a hamstring away from being out the entire year. And he's <laughs> not hes not anything anymore. Let's, let's stop pretending Darren Waller is a top-tier tight end anymore. He's not. And name one receiver on their team. Oh, watch out. Jalen Hyatt might break out. Uh, okay. St I mean, like, they've had the same receiving core for years. They've never had a bona fide number one. That Kenny Galladay contract they handed out three years ago still biting them to this day. They don't have any running running game. Their offensive line is decent when healthy. Andrew Thomas is a stud at left tackle. Evan Neal is a bust at right tackle. They got to fill out that interior. I mean, I don't really think there's like, this isn't even a quarterback friendly type of team. Like, I don't see like a veteran coming here and even fixing this. Like a guy like Daniel Jones wow. has unfortunately never been able to get over the hump. He's never had a elite supporting cast around him. Yeah. Uh, Brian Dable, I think, you know, we saw what he did in his first year with the Giants. Everyone's like, wow, Brian Dable's this elite-level coach. Like, he was able to bring the Giants to the playoffs, win a playoff game, and it blew up in his face last year when the expectations went up. So I think that Crystal Ball tells me Daniel Jones is not a long-term Giant. I am not really – not to mention, which is probably the biggest thing, is availability is in question. He gets hurt every single year. It's a neck injury. It's a leg injury. It's this injury. Like, he relies too much on his legs. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Daniel Jones. I'll never forget being in college for the draft um, for this year's draft. And I was watching the draft with a bunch of my Giants fan buddies. And their biggest fear was them drafting Daniel Jones. And when they drafted Daniel Jones, I couldn't stop laughing because I hate the Giants. And I'm like, yeah, baby, Daniel Jones to the Giants. And I loved every second of it. Fast forward five years later and look where we are. Dan? 
And so Ben, right to add to that story, I think I remember after like week four of his rookie season, he had like a great game and they put out together like this like nice little feel good video right before a game. It's like, we're sorry, Dan. We were wrong. Daniel Jones, we were wrong, man. We love you here in New York. And then he went right back to sucking. It was beautiful. I love that. I love feel good stories that are played before an NFL game. And then, like, they do not meet expectations. They just go out there and lay an absolute egg. Daniel Jones, man, he is not going to be a New York Giant next season. I don't think that they are going to draft a quarterback this year either. I think they're going to do one last Hail Mary. I think they're going to be looking for a receiver. I think Romo Dunze, Malik Neighbors, perhaps might be a pretty solid fit over there. And that's even if they decide to stay at the six overall pick. Maybe they trade down. But not only do I see Daniel Jones being on the hot seat. I see Dable being on the hot seat as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think that New York and I think that the Giants organization is not very patient. I mean, ever since Tom Coughlin retired, ever since he was done with that overall situation over in New York, they have been a revolving door of new head coaches that are coming in. So at average about two to three years, I think that the Giants are definitely set to hit a reset as of right now. And Actually, I'll take a step back. I think they trade down this year, and I don't think that that they go for a quarterback. And then I think Daniel Jones and Brian Dable are gone. Now this this is Ooh. a very this is a very interesting player here. Um, and the predictions on for his future. If they allow him to play this season, mm-hmm. he could very well be a long-term giant in 2025 let me explain why we know what he was early in his career but they said it had more to do with the coaching and structure dayball comes in and let's be honest here he had his best season he only played 16 games remember that okay um if he had played the other three games in the season his stats might have even been even better but he had his highest career completion he had his high completion percentage of 67 percent he threw for 3200 yards and on average it would have been almost 4,000 if he would have played the full season right um he had a three to one touchdown to interception ratio what knocked everybody that it was only 15 touchdowns and five interceptions. He only had 15 touchdowns because they love running the ball, leaning on the running backs. But he also added a big, a large amount of rushing yards in the season as well. And in that season, he won a playoff game Ooh. against the hottest team in the NFL, the Minnesota Vikings, 31 I forgot about, that. I forgot about and, that. And when he won that playoff game, he had 69% in it. He had 301 yards. He threw for two touchdowns with zero interception and even rushing. He rushed for 78 yards in that game in the playoff. That, that was a monster game for him. Monster game. In the playoffs, in the big moment, he comes back this year. He only plays six games, but don't forget his games. He was having, having his career best completion percentage at 68%, better than the year before. 900 yards, which was pretty much still not the greatest ever. 900 passing yards on pace for about 3,000 again, but that's how he that's how it works. But what they didn't like is he threw on average one interception a game, two touchdowns, six interceptions to start the season. He did rush the ball a little bit, almost like 300, 400 yards or whatever it may have been. But to be quite honest with you, man, they may they may not look at it as a bad thing because he only played six games. You want to know who else struggled early last year? Josh Allen in the season. You know, so you can't take six games and just say, oh, our patience is worn thin. He came off of a good season in 22 and barely played in 23. Um, now, if you want to say the injury concerns are starting to be an issue, then that's a different story. But they're going to give him the chance, I believe, this season, and they might even draft the quarterback just in case. That's why That's why I feel that way about the Dolphins. The smart thing for them to do is draft the quarterback just in case and let Daniel Jones be the starter. And if he can get back to 2022 and grow from that, he's going to be their long-term answer. If he can't, then at least they got insurance. So I'm not going to write off Daniel Jones as an automatic, yeah, he's on the hot seat, he's done. And what do you want Dayball to do? 
What do you want him to do losing his quarterback in year two? Year one, he balled out. I don't think, you know, so I'm not going to put Dayball on a hot seat in that situation because he lost his quarterback, but the first year he came in and won a playoff game his first year. Miami is yet to do that, and are they saying Mike McDaniels on a hot seat? So um, I, I'm not going to write um, – Daniel Jones off. I know time is running out, man. This took some Woo! time getting through these quarterbacks. TD hosting is elite <laughs> stuff, baby. Great job. Here we get a round of applause for TD. Hosting right. and planning his first The Huddle Show. Only took 37 <laughs> episodes for this day. Hey, hey. Uh, I, I, the first time I was asked. So, hey, I'm, I'm here for you. <laughs> Listen. All right. So, um, we do have a few more minutes. Let's at least all of us give one coach that we yeah. feel is the is at the top of the hot seat right now. If the person before you answers what you were going to say, you got to give me another one. Go we're going to start with Richie. Let's go. Robert Sala. Ooh, I had Whoa. him on my list. I had him on 100%. my list. I get it. Yeah, 100% Robert that. Sala. I mean, bro, Jets fans are so happy right now. Why? Because of the job that Joe Douglas is doing. And he has done a fantastic job filling in this roster. Robert Sala has not proven to be an NFL coach yet. He has not had one winning season, never been to the playoffs. All he's done is been able to build a championship-level defense, but that does not cut it in the NFL when you're a head coach. He's done a tremendous job and deserves all the credit for that. He's hired the right people on his defensive coaching staff. He got an excellent defensive mind to be the, the head of that defense and Jeff Ulbrich, who I think is a future head coach in this league, who is our defensive coordinator, but he has not proven to be able to get a winning season. So he's on the hot seat. If Robert Sala goes out there this year and the Jets don't make the playoffs and they're healthy with Rodgers, he's, he's out of here. Like, there's no sugarcoating it. I, I, I'm a big fan of him. I believe in his philosophy. I believe in his mindset. I believe in his culture. I love that he values uh, character in his players. He's a player's first type of coach. He's an elite-level defensive mind. But the offense got to get figured out. The special team's got to be there. He's got to hold his players accountable, and the Jets got to win. This team is so loaded on paper, it's absolutely ridiculous how, how loaded we are. Like, look at the roster. It's the best Jets roster ever, and I will say that. You'll be like, oh, Richie, here we go, hyping up the Jets. I've known every <laughs> single roster, roster on the Jets no, my entire life. This is the best roster on paper ever. You talk about five all pros on defense mixed in with a Hall of Fame quarterback and the offensive rookie of the year in Garrett Wilson, a promising stud, one of the top running backs in the league in Brees Hall, matched in with Mike Williams now. You bring in the the best left tackle this generation in Tyron. I can keep going. I mean, this defense in this team overall is ridiculous. So, yes, Robert Sala is on the hot seat. If he cannot win with this roster, he's not a head coach in this league. You don't think he's tied to the two-year Aaron Rodgers window? This is the second year. Well, I'm saying, but Rodgers may play two years, two more years, right? Okay, you don't but think he's kind of tied to that? So you're telling me if the Jets, like, what Missed happens? The they miss the playoffs this year, that he's coming back next year? No, with I'm Aaron? with you. I'm with you. He's definitely on the hot seat. I'm just saying. I'll tell you this right they, now. If the Jets do not make the playoffs and Rodgers is healthy and everyone's, it is not an injury concern, there's not one fan, one Jets fan that's going to say, bring, like, there's people that wanted Salah gone after this year. Mm. I would say, like, wow. majority of Jets fans wanted Salah gone after this year. Like, my friend Jack, he hates him. Like, he, like, wow. doesn't so. believe it. Like, there's a lot of Jets fans that do not believe in Robert Sala. Now, He's I like do think that he does have the ability, getting seven wins – in that season like that with bottom barrel, like I think, unfortunately for Salah, he's never had a legit quarterback. Now, obviously, you can point the blame at him. He's part of drafting Zach Wilson, right? But like, I want to see what this team looks like with Salah mm -hmm. and a good quarterback, and that's Aaron Rodgers. So he's definitely and, on the hot seat. And, and real quick, if they do um, bum out, the only person that I believe can save Salah is Aaron Rodgers, saying, "No, I'll keep him." Do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, okay, I mean, yeah. You know, there, that is one thing. Aaron Rodgers is very, very um, supportive likes, of Salah, yeah. genuinely, too. Very genuine. When I hear him talk about him, I can, I can tell if he's serious and he believes in Salah. And I, I think that's a big thing uh, with, nice. with the owners as well. All right, Dan, who you got on the hot seat? It's Matt Eberflus out of Chicago. My Ooh. friend, how he still has his job this year and how they still trust him with this new absolute star-studded out roster that they are going to be filling out for Caleb Williams coming to town. If this team, and I mean, I'll be honest with you, man, this he better win at least minimum nine games or he's gone. 
He has no excuse not to be competitive in the NFC North. I understand it's a rookie quarterback, but I'll be honest with you, man. They're spending a lot of money, and they are creating one of the best environments a young quarterback can go into, can fall into. If they go out there, and if they win four to five games, he's done. He's absolutely out. His he, his seat is fiery hot. I promise you that. Nice, nice. Well, I got my last. This is the last one. Um, I was going to go Mike McCarthy, but I think everybody already knows that's like some kind of weird thing over there. He might be a placeholder. Jerry Jones wouldn't even re-up the money. Okay. So my hot seat is Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota. Um, let me tell you why. Um, if you're going to lose as a head coach, don't lose on your side of the ball. Just like with the Chargers last year. You know, a defensive coach, you spent all the money in the world on the defense. And that was one of the biggest issues as well. Kevin O'Connell on the offensive side of the ball is not has not done a good job um, in Minnesota. Um, when you even look early with Kirk Cousins, when he was healthy and they were losing some of those games early on, offense would kill the team at the end of the game with turnovers and things of that nature. So um, at the end of the day, I believe that he is definitely on the hot seat and he better watch out because if he doesn't succeed this year and the defense plays lights out with a whole new defense again, they might just promote Brian Flores as the head coach. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Those are your top three coaches on the hot seat. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 37 of The Huddle. Let let me do like Dan and see if we got a hundred likes today. Oh, I'm nervous. Did we get it? <laughs> oh, come on, y'all. It's 89. Hit ah. that like button. Hit that like button. Richie, any last words you got for everyone? Hit that like button. Come on now, <laughs> baby. It's Friday. You guys are not going to see us the next two days. We don't do this seven days a week. We do it five days a week. We need some break, even though I will miss you all. So, guys, hit the like button if you're enjoying the show. Just want to give a big shout-out to the chat. Thank you guys so much. You're the one that makes this possible for us to be able to do what we do every single Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The NFL Draft is so close, and we're excited to continue the coverage here on the channel. Shout-out to everybody tuning in. We love you all. And let's go, Jets, baby. And Robert Sala, you're on the hot seat right now, but you'll be off of it. After we win the division this year, it going to run, and you get an extension. Come on, Sala. I want to believe in you. Prove it, baby. Had to finish awesome. it off with that. <laughs> what about you, Dan? Any last words? Hey, man, listen. I think this is actually pretty cool because we still ended up having, like, peak 250 people in here watching, and not one of the topics circulated around one of our teams. Which for the most true. part, which is pretty solid, dude. So we yeah. know that y'all just love talking ball in here in the chat. So we appreciate that, folks. Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. EST. Always mark your calendar and make sure that those notifications are on so you never miss a damn episode. On the road to 6,000 subscribers, go subscribe now and check out BetUS TV every day. We love you all. Peace. We are out. Thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed the show, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button, folks, and subscribe to the channel. If you hit that notification bell, you'll get notified every single time we go live or make a video here on BetUS TV. Also, do not forget to check out more sports content over at BetUSTV.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. Can't wait to see you guys again soon.